Um, so today I want to tell you about um, what we, and by we I mean we strange complexity scientists and not so many of us, what we understand under complexity. So I'm by training, I'm a physicist. I've been but working in, in yeah, more data-driven research over the last um, decade and more. And so I think we have there a completely different notion of complexity um, than you have. Um, but as I already realized when talking to some of you before this talk, of course there are some interfaces, there is some overlap. And so before I go into how, from our point of view, um, what are the reasonable chances that you have to manage complexity, I first want to tell you um, what we understand under complexity and how we define it. And the other thing that I want to mention is, even if the title says otherwise, I'm going to spend only small amount of time talking about the pandemics because if there's one thing that we have talked enough about in the last half in the year or so it's obviously COVID. Uh, there is also planned for a Q&A afterwards so if you have questions about the pandemics of course feel free to ask them to me but if I can choose the topic about which I can talk then it's not COVID. Okay so that being said let's jump right into it. So for us to manage a system and by us I mean physicists slash mathematicians slash computer scientists um, slash data scientists, so a um, crowd that is very detached from some of you maybe. If we say we want to manage a system, then we talk about the ability to predict which kind of results or which kind of impact my interventions will have. Okay, so this is, this is at the end of the day what we want to answer. And if we don't have this ability, we are not managing. We are playing roulette. We leave it up to chance. So the question is, of course, um, how can we do this in complex systems? Before we unpack that, as I told you, I'm a physicist. So the first question to ask is, so which systems can we actually predict? And it turns out the class of systems that we can, to, uh, with a certain reliability, predict is very narrow. We can make good predictions about very, very small systems, say one to 10 components, something like that. If you, if you have a spring and you detach a weight to the spring, then yeah, you can solve a harmonic oscillator. If you put uh, two females and one male person into a bar, or two males and one female, then at the end of the evening you have one happy male and one unhappy male. So this kind of, of social interactions in small systems are also to a certain extent predictable. Why? Because here we have a chance to get the laws right, to get the physics right, to get the sociology right, to really get the science underlying this right, if we have a small system with uh, only a few number of interactions. It turns out we are also good at predicting systems if they're very large. And by large, I mean 10 to the power of 28 components. Why? Because then statistics kicks in. I know I can predict if I heat the water under standard conditions to 100 degrees Celsius, it will boil. This I can do because this is the statistics behind it work this. I can make a prediction that if I put basically a rock into space and I make this more opaque and opaque, then it will be trap more heat and the planet will get warmer. This is a prediction that I can make very easily because the statistics works. Now, what are complex systems? Mm, they are something in between. They are too big, too multi-layered that you have any chance of getting the laws right. At the same time, they are also too small and dynamic and too much driven by mutual interdependencies that you can do statistics because any of you has done only one course in statistics knows the first assumption that you make is that the th two things are not correlated with each other and if you go to an advanced course then maybe you learn some, some multivariate regressions but that's basically end of story. And the consequence is since for, ma for most of the systems that we have to do in real life they fall within this class. So we stand in front of them and say, yeah, it's very complicated, like Fred Sinovac did in the 1980s. So now it's not 1980, it's 2021. So what can we do now? And now let me tell you how we define complex systems. Complex systems consist of many components. Um, these components, they have certain properties and they interact with each other. So that's still quite general. And now the important point, details matter. Okay, details matter. Who interacts with whom, under which conditions, in which way? This you need to know. And the, um, if you put this together, what you have is that the interactions in your system, so like uh, you and your organization talking to each other, these interactions determine the properties of the components. And as the properties of the components change, the way that things interact also changes. So you have a feedback loop here 
between how the states of the components change and which kind of interactions you have in your system. And this feedback is what makes complex systems complex. If they don't have this system, uh, these feedbacks, they may be complicated, they may be hard to understand, but from our point of view, they're not complex. Um, let's make this, and this is now my COVID slide, let's make this that now I can tell you why a pandemic is a prime example of a complex system. So think of this here as a social interaction network. And uh, the blue dots are the susceptible, it's a susceptible population, and you, you have one infected uh, skiing traveler returning from Ischgl, uh, who's shown there in red. And then uh, he meets people in, in his household, infects them. So this is then in the second network, and then we say, oh, okay, now we've got a problem. Uh, this is spreading, so we need to make some interventions. You um, quarantine the people, you say reduce the social contacts, you restructure the network. Um, by restructuring that, you have an impact of how the epidemic unfolds. So people will recover faster than they get infected. So the, the epidemic wave goes down, and you say, ah, oh, now it's fine, we have it under control, please interact with each other again, and then you get the next wave. And this is feedback loops, um, in, in the prime example, and this is uh, what, uh, yeah, why managing COVID means managing a complex systems. And when I say it's, it's a prime example, this is really a textbook example. In 2018, we've written a textbook on complex systems. And the first example that we put there, what a complex system is, is epidemic spreading. And I show you here is one result that tells you why these networks matter. Okay, so here um, is, uh, you see on the x-axis, you see the immun immunization rate. Okay, this is how many people we vaccinate. On the y-axis, you see the fraction of infected people. If you, people would interact homogeneously, if networks wouldn't matter, then what you would expect is the curve that is shown here in gray. And there you have something, a term that you might have heard, that's herd immunity or population immunity, if you are politically correct. And that means once we have, um, vaccinated enough people, basically the epidemics will end because uh, in each neighborhood you have then more people um, um, already vaccinated or immunized um, than could be infected by one case and so basically you have an exponential damping. Uh, one of the basic results of network theory is that this doesn't happen in many real, ne real networks and this doesn't happen in networks where interaction patterns are heterogeneous, where you have we now all know the name of this, where you have super spreaders, where you have over dispersion, meaning that the vast number of infections stem from a small number of people. And if this happens, you can actually mathematically show that there is no herd immunity threshold in such kind of networks. And this tells you why, in order to make a statement about a system, you need to know the interactions and the interaction networks that govern that system, because they expect now that if we hit 70-80% vaccination that the pandemic will go away is plainly wrong. But what we know is that these waves will get smaller and smaller, and this is what uh, means it becomes endemic. But okay, enough about COVID. So why um, do we believe in now that you can manage complex systems? Well, we have two game changers at work. First, new data. Okay, we collect now digital fingerprints basically from all areas of life. That means many of these networks that actually determine the systems that we are living in can now be quantified for the first time. And of course, as you also know, um, computational power isn't really much of an issue anymore. But equally important, we also have new methods. I, talked, uh, I told you about one of the central results from network theory and the math and the statistics of how we can deal with such strongly correlated systems is also advancing at a quite brisk pace and there I haven't even started to talk about artificial intelligence and causal inference and this kind of stuff. So um, the thing is we can, uh, these this networks, we can now start to quantify them because we have the data and we can start to play around with prediction models because we have the, me the methods. And this puts us, I think, today in the, we are the first generation on this planet in, in the humanity who therefore has actually the chance to manage this kind of complexity. Okay, and now let's, uh, let me um, tone down the bullshitting and give you some concrete example now what this means. And I'm gonna show you examples from three different areas. First being uh, healthcare, not COVID. Second, uh, finance. And the third one being organizations and institutions. So first example. Um, you might have read this article, so we don't need theory anymore. Uh, because we have now AI and we just throw all the data into a machine and this will then um, yeah, solve all problems that humankind faces. And the only person who can write such an article is of course a journalist who has never worked with such kind of things. And um, to show you how we approach um, 
data-driven medicine, so to say. Here, here is an example that comes from Microsoft. So they develop um, basically a rule-based learning system, which they fed data from 15,000 pneumonia patients. And then they ask, so wh wh which of these patients are gonna die? And the result of the algorithm was a rule, if you have asthma, you have a lower chance of dying. So the, the machine learned the rule, asthma means, okay, you're safe from pneumonia. Is this what happens? No, of course not. The process is that patients, if, if they are at admission, it is known that they have asthma, they are immediately brought to the intensive care units, and that's why they have a better outcome, because they are under a stronger vigilance regime. So um, this means, this is why we believe that machine learning alone won't solve the issue, because at the end of the day, it's a black box problem. And our aspiration is very much to open up this black box. And if you do that, then you will find that basically our health is a determinant of networks upon networks upon networks that interact with each other. I told you already how your risk of catching an infectious disease depends on the social network that you're embedded in. But of course, you have networks down to the cellular processes that determine which kind of diseases you might catch. And the, what, what medicine, the revolution that medicine is now going through is to really understand this, uh, these different networks on different um, orders of magnitude uh, in a data-driven way. So for instance, this is a work that we did. So before we were in the business of predicting COVID, we were in the business of predicting chronic diseases to know we, how, many, how many hospital beds we need in 30 years to treat our aging population that will have a more and more, a higher and higher disease burden to do cardiovascular disorders. And the kind of model that we use here, there um, um, uses the fact that we can use data from past hospital admissions and see if you have disease X, say you're female, age 40, and you have diabetes. Then you can look at which other diseases um, we have, have then observed in the same patient within the next 10 years. And by that, you also have a spreading process on network, now not in infectious diseases on social networks, but if you have diabetes, we know you are at an increased risk of getting other diseases that are in proximity of this disease network that we construct here out of observational data. And then we can say, okay, if you have diabetes within the next 10 years, there's a chance of uh, your, your risk is increased, increased by a factor of 2.6 to also suffer the, uh, depression um, by uh, 9.5 to also have hypertension and risks for strokes, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out by knowing the simple network of which kind of comorbidities about complex health state patients have, you can predict um, the um, upcoming disease incidences with a confidence between 85 and 95 percent. I show this because this is a very simple model. You can make this more, more um, ex um, exact if you do some more fancy methods, but I'm not going into that here. Now, the next thing that you can look at is if between two health problems, if you go to a GP, so you maybe have been to a hospital and then they told you when they released you, okay, but you should go to a follow-up visit uh, in, in, in six months to see if everything is right. And my bet would be that if you have gone to such a follow-up visit, then the chance is very likely that you are a woman because men don't go to this follow-up visit because they are so healthy anyhow. Actually, we see this then in the data. Um, females have better outcomes then because they do this follow-up visits and have then a 50% decreased risk of chronic diseases, whereas men don't do this follow-up visits, and then we see them a couple of years later with much higher severity of the diseases. So if you notice networks and if you can link this disease layer to the layer of how you go to your general practitioner, how you go to your, to your physician, then we can also find means of optimizing this because then maybe we need to make it, to give you a little bit nudging to go through this to, to your doctor then six, six months later in order to, to um, reduce the burden our, on our healthcare system. You can do the same for side effects. Um, so of course, if you have this, if you can link this, this data about which person has shown up to the hospital with which kind of prescriptions they had before, then um, you are the advantage that you have for each, for each specific combination of medication. You can compute a control group in your data where you make can valid statistical comparisons and, and find out uh, which combination therapies do you need to treat a certain patient. So this is, I think, a huge topic that is only just starting to explode, that in the, in the future we might need to do less and less very expensive clinical trials, but instead we produce certain parts of the trial, namely uh, the placebo part, um, from, from observational data. Um, the other thing, of course, is that uh, we also get, collect more and more data through, through sensors. Here's a, a, a work that we did with diabetes patients that had these the sensors that do continuous glucose monitoring. Um, 
future is also in adding these kind of data streams to um, the other health data that we really find therapists that integrate the data that you monitor yourself at home with your variables, with your apps, that you don't share this data with Google, but that you share this data with your physicians, that the physicians have the skills and the knowledge in order to process the data such that it can impact your, um, your treatment. And, and this is something that we really need to work on. Good. Um, finally, um, we, um, can we also look at networks of how you go from doctor to doctor. So you might have heard that you that you that we ru will run into problems due to a shortage of physicians because they are now aging, they're retiring, and we can't replace them as fast as, as we as we need to do. And actually, we, we've we've done some work on looking at if um, physician retires, how do the patient flows restructure themselves? To which kind of doctor do patients go after the physician has retired? If you know that, then you can predict if now in this district these two doctors retire. It, won't, it might be the case that not all patients living there still find a GP within 20 kilometers of the area where they are living. And this kind of information we need in, our, uh, in order to prepare our healthcare system for the challenges that we have ahead. And the vision that we're working towards is to build a digital twin of the healthcare system based on observational data. So if you've seen me in the media advocating why we need to link data in the health system, it is really because we need to have this integrated view and in order to inform the decisions that we make in order how we can treat our population better, better by, by data and by this kind of complex models. Good. So this was the medicine example. Uh, now touch upon the work that we do in finance and economics. Actually, this full-scale simulation, so to say, was invented in economics. You just see the first models for economists. These were hydrodynamic computers, so where they had uh, yeah, pistons and water reservoirs for money that they shoved around. Very, very interesting story, but it's, uh, what, what I'm now tell you, what I'm going to tell you is one thing that we are, um, is particularly a property of complex systems, namely that is the fact that they show a new kind of risk that we haven't been used to dealing with in, in often in non-complex systems, namely the systemic risk. Uh, to phrase it better, um, the way that we need to deal with the systemic risk in complex systems is, is different from uh, the way that we have to, uh, have to deal with this risk in other systems. So what is systemic risk? That's the, the, ri the risk that a substantial part of your system starts to fail due to an initially localized event. And uh, we could now go into which kind, why this is different from credit risk, why this is different from economic risk. Uh, basically, it's different because it spreads in a different way on network. Um, and, um, the, and that's one thing. And the other thing is that no one has an incentive to manage systemic risk. Okay, if you're a bank, you have no incentive to, be, to make sure that all your competitors are healthy, even if your own health depends on the health of your competitors. And this is um, something that you can address in a quantitative way, how we can rectify that. And here is, is an example of, of how we do that. So there we look at financial transaction networks between banks. So again, we have the network. Those are the financial transactions between banks, borrowing, and lending. Uh, we have the properties of the nodes. These are in these times basically the balance sheet structure that you have, your assets and liabilities. Um, if you know this kind of dependency networks, then you can compute an indicator that tells you if one of your business partners goes bankrupt, what is the re how many assets might you have to write off in order to, to um, accommodate this loss. And by this, you, have, you can construct contagion models, not of infectious diseases, but of financial stress on this kind of networks. And um, what turns out that there is not really such a thick thing as too big to fail. So this would be a too big to fail situation here. We have one bank, that's the large red one, that has in this setting here a high systemic risk. And then we have a second largest bank, the orange one, that has, um, and the orange color should this, um, signify that this has also systemic risk, but not as high as the red one. Now, the um, thing that happens is if um, so if we know that if this huge red bank, if this goes bust, a lot of other banks who depend on this will also go bust. And now this bank gives a loan to the smaller bank. And let's say this, this loan is just in the, in, the, in, the, in the magnitude that it might um, bring this already risky bank, push it over the threshold to go to default. 
If this happens, then essentially the systemic risk of the big bank has been transferred to the smaller bank. Because if now the smaller bank goes bankrupt, it won't repay its loan to the bigger bank, and this then might, tr might trigger a cascade in the system. So what you have in these types of networks is that this kind of systemic risk is spreading with the interactions that you have in the system in a way that is often not monitored. In finance, this is not monitored. If you know the Basel II, Basel IV, Basel III regulations or whatever, they don't monitor this. We monitor credit risk, not systemic risk. And um, if this is also the case um, for your organization, this I leave up to you. But the point is you can, if you know the network, you can compute this kind of systemic risks. And by this, work out how resilient your system is with respect to certain types of shocks. So this is then this, this thing applied for the, for the financial transaction network in, in, in Austria, where you can then see, okay, over the years before you read about these banks in the news, you could see this in the network that these banks soon will be in the news. And um, then you can start to play, if you have a computer model of the systems, you can start to play around with interventions. So if now one bank goes bankrupt, who should pay for this? Other banks, the population, taxpayers, do we want to make a bail-in, bail-out? And this is what we then addressed in this kind of modeling work that we show, okay, if you have such a default, how can you best, um, so to say, um, manage the outfall resulting from that in order to, um, yeah, see that, that um, for instance, um, uh, economic activity is, is not really much impeded by this. Um, we also use this kind of simulator to look at natural catastrophes. So if you link then this financial um, network that I've just shown you, you can link the, the agent in this model, you can, use it, you can link it to um, specific companies uh, sitting on close to a river or not, and then assume as a shock not one bank going bankrupt but a flood, and then you have the companies that have to um, scale down their production because they're affected by this flood and how, what kind of ripple effects does this cause. And here is a simulation result for that for floods in Austria where you can basically see how our risk, um, uh, economic risk due to floods is distributed across specific sectors, across specific regions. Yes. Uh, with this, I'm coming to the third example where I show you how we apply our thinking and our, our methods to organizations and institutions. So um, for us, an organization is basically a sum of communication flows. It's a sum of, it's a multi-layered communication network. So you have the communications that you do informally on the hallway, you have emails, Slack, Teams, whatever. And um, the thing is many of these information layers, you can, quantify now. You can look at, if you can, um, yeah, in principle, if there would be no data uh, um, protection rules, you could look at all this kind of information flows and look at how, um, if, if your communication structure actually aligns with your organizational structure as you believe it to be. Which kind of departments do you really have? Who is talking with which other, who, which people are not talking with each other? And if you know these kind of things, then you can look at where are bottlenecks, where are choke points in the way that information flows through this company. How resilient is it? If, if certain people um, fall out, get, uh, get sick, what does this do to your communication structure in, in the organization? And of course, if you do some interventions, you can measure what are the impacts of them? How do they change the way that people communicate in this company? All this is quantifiable. And to, uh, this I want to show you with, um, with, a, with a case study that we did. And um, we did it with the Hungarian uh, National University of Public Service. So these are basically policemen in, in education. And as, as you know, in there they go through, through trails. So they, they, they have trails for specific catastrophes. So for, for example, in 2016, there was a trail for extreme weather. In 2018, there was an um, 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 attack using, using, using poisonous gas at the airport. And these are, yeah, this, this exercise happened in different ways. But um, what, what happens there is that so the students should assume the role of their organization. So let's say the, the customs department, the police, the, the fire department, and so forth. And then they're given certain tasks. So for example, due to extreme weather, there is a, is a, is a tree lying around the road and you now have to dispatch uh, police in order to make a roadblock. You have to send a bulldozer there and this kind of stuff. And then they go through these scenarios. And within these controlled exercises, you can, you can monitor the actions of all the participants. And um, so in the first exercise that we did, we had about 1,000 participants. 
they were separated into 90 organizations and they had to solve this kind of problems. Now, there, there were two twists. First, it was in one, on one day they were, were working in the usual hierarchy. In the second one, they adopted uh, an emergency hierarchy. I'm not going now into the details of how they differ, but basically it had to do with how much vertical versus how much horizontal communication do you have in your organization. The second twist that we had is, so they were briefed for the exercises. They were told, this will happen, and then you have to do that. This will happen, and then you have to do that. But then, occasionally, also events were put in for which they were not prepared. So they had to do problem solving on the fly. And um, here you should see, if, oh, it doesn't work. OK, sorry. The video doesn't play here, but um, what you can now then is to look at how the communication network between these observations unfold over the day. And I just show you the static version of this picture. So already by looking at with plain eye at this, you see that the communication network on day one, uh, where they had only exclusively events um, for which they were briefed, looks very different from the communica communication network at the day two, where they also had to solve tasks for which they were not prepared. In particular, they were also um, you see that, there was, um, that certain departments um, or certain clusters are much more clearer in the, in the, in the, uh, on the first day than on the second day. The colors here are the hierarchy levels. So whether this was a national organization or whether this was a regional organization. And um, you can now ask, so how do, did they respond to these different interventions on different levels? depending on whether they were prepared or not, and measure um, um, things like redundancy, vulnerability, efficiency, here really in terms of network indicators. So what are the information flow bottlenecks? Uh, how, how efficient was, um, how long did it take that information from one part reached another part of the network? And this all becomes quantifiable. And um, the, the outcome, by the way, was uh, when, the, when they switched to, the, um, to, to events for which they were not prepared, much more vertical communication set in, and the lower levels of the organization became much more effective, the higher levels much more ineffective. But the drawback to this was that the communication structures they built were much less redundant. Okay, and then in the next exercise, we put them into an airport and gave them RFID tags. And then um, it was simulated that um, and, and, yeah, um, this, this airport needs to be evacuated. I'm also not going into, on into what happened here. Just uh, a couple of weeks after we did this, this actually happened in the, in the airport. So sometimes these trails really pay off and, and people are then better prepared. Okay, and with this, I'm at the end of my, of my talk. So here my take home messages are that we now have maybe for the first time in human history the chance to manage complex systems on a data-driven basis. We need to get the data right, we need to get the methods right, but if we do this, this homework, then we have some chances in order to, to manage complex systems in, in the way that we can optimize interrelated networks. And thanks for your attention.